All right, so now we're going to talk about my favorite subject, and that's the, the dogs that are not using their teeth as much as their noses. Um, and the, the military and police dogs are usually what we call dual trained, so they actually do detection work as well. But the, the dogs that I've spent most of my career working with are the search and rescue dogs, and they're all about their noses. But what else can dogs detect? We know about bomb dogs or explosive detection dogs, drug dogs, the live scent human um, detection dogs, those are search and rescue dogs, so they're looking for live victims. And that's different from the cadaver, which is now called human remains detection. So those are the dogs that are looking for human remains. Um, and that's really important in a lot of situations. It's actually one of the biggest growing areas for detection dogs. Another really interesting area is biological threats. Dogs can be um, trained to detect various biological threats. And, and we've been talking to some folks about you know, what about the possibility of using these dogs for avian influenza and for other biological threats, particularly those that don't impact the dog. Uh, so salmonella in horses is another one that we've, we've been kind of throwing around. Is that something that the dogs would be able to help us identify? Infectious diseases, again, in that. Um, the other biological threats would be um, things that, again, don't affect the dogs but would affect humans. Uh, cancer is a big area. It's an area that we are actually just about to embark on. Um, we just got a grant so that we can study the effect of dogs identifying um, patient samples, not patients, but samples from patients, whether they have cancer or don't have cancer, and see if they can differentiate. So we're very excited about that area. So when we're talking about scent and detection, what we're talking about is how that whole process happens, how does the dog recognize the scent? Where does that scent come from? Now, we can use the skunk sample, uh, example, or we can use the chocolate chip cookie example, whichever you're feeling you know, more like you want to pursue. But you know the moment you get that little slightest whiff um, of something, and then it becomes stronger and stronger And with the chocolate chip cookies, as you go to the kitchen um, and get the cookies, you, you know, you're drawn to that. And that's the same way it works with a dog. There's this thing called a scent cone. So it emanates from a source. And as it goes further and further away from that source, it gets less concentrated. And so the dog follows that to the most concentrated source. So what kind of detection dogs are there? There's really three kinds that we kind of typically think about. There's tracking and trailing. Um, and then there's air scenting. So we'll talk a little bit about these. The tracking and trailing, depending on who you talk to, some people are adamant that they're very separate. Other people are, are sort of like, well, they kind of cross over. And it, you, know, you can kind of use both of those terms interchangeably. Because most of what I do is the air scenting dogs. I am going to be a little bit more general on the tracking and trailing dogs um, and focus predominantly on the air scenting. But just so you have a sense of what we're talking about. So the tracking dogs are typically dogs that are in harness and on leash their noses to the ground. They're really looking for the footsteps of the person um, that, that has gone that direction. Um, you can have a scent article so that they potentially could follow a single person. Um, and they're most effective if you don't have a lot of other people in the area. The trailing dogs, again, are on leash, nose to the ground. Um, and they're going to definitely be following the scent of a specific person. You do have to have that scent article so they can follow that specific trail. Um, and they, ver they don't actually follow the footsteps, but more of the, what we call the sort of cloud. If you think about pig pen um, in peanuts, and he's got that cloud of dust. We actually all have kind of a cloud of dust um, that we, we shed as we walk around. And so that's, that's what they're following. But the air scenting ones are the ones that, that just amaze me so much. And, and that is because they're so flexible and they can really be trained to find anything. Anything that has its own unique odor, these dogs can learn to find. And they don't, when they're finding humans, they don't care who it is. They don't require a specific scent article. They actually find any human. And the caveat to that is it's typically what we call a concealed human. And you'll see. Um, some demonstrations of that in the videos that I'm going to show later on is people that are not in view or their, their source is concentrated. 
Um, when I work with the customs um, and border protection folks, they're always looking for concealed people being smuggled across the border. So there can be a vehicle full of people sitting in their chair, you know, their seats, and hidden in the trunk is a person. The dog will ignore all the people sitting where they're supposed to, and they will alert on the person in the trunk. It's fascinating. Um, I even talked to some of the agents that say, even somebody like tucked down behind a seat, they'll alert on that even if there are other people in. So it's just an, an amazing concept of how these dogs can differentiate people in the open from concealed humans. These dogs can work on or off leash, depending on what their job is. They can work on land or water. Um, for the humans, they can, again, live or cadaver or human remains. Um, and any other specific scent. Bed bug dogs are, are sort of been the rage lately. These dogs are so amazing. They can find one live bed bug. That's the standard for bed bug dogs. Um, crazy. All right, what are, you, what are the characteristics? What do you have to do to be a detection dog? Is there a specific or unique feature? Well, most of them, we like a medium size. Now, there's some really big ones and there's some really little ones, but on average, they're medium size. They really have to be physically fit. The thing about a detection dog is it's that dog that's going to drive you crazy, right? So it's, it's like, all right, I threw the ball for you six times. Are we done? And they're like, no, let's do it again. Let's do it again. All right, let's go, let's go. They need a job. And what you want that is that, that persistence play drive and that prey drive, that desire to chase things, to seek for things, to really look. Because if you were trapped in a building, you would want to make sure you had that dog looking for you because you don't want him to give up and say, you know, I've looked you know, for five minutes. I'm done. Um, you really want that dog that is going to continue and continue and continue. And those dogs can be a little annoying to live with. Um, so it's, it's really important to find that balance. Um, and this is, this is Bear. He's one of the, um, the first search dogs I ever worked with. Yes, question. That's a great question. And the question about their noses is one we haven't really answered. We know that the olfactory capacity is related to the area of their nose. But the detection ability has so much more to do with what they can detect and how they process it and how they tell us. So a Jack Russell can be great, except he might not come back and tell you. <laughs> so those are, the, you know, those are the, the challenges that we face. So it is, it's kind of that whole package. And I'll show you some of the different breeds that have been used and successfully. So it's, it's really strong individual. Dogs with a hunting history is what we focus on because they've been bred for generations to use their noses to find things. But has anybody heard of the, the uh, new sport, a relatively new sport called canine nose work? It's a totally fun sport, and any dog can do it. You see the craziest breeds, and all they're doing is they're, they're sniffing out. And they, to start the training, you just you hide some treats in a cardboard box. Um, and one of the games I always played with my dog, just to keep him out of my hair, was I'd go hide a toy for him so he'd have to like, go spend some time finding it. Um, and that, that's a really good thing. And you know everybody can do it. It's, it's remarkable. It opens your eyes. I, I don't know. Have you ever seen a bulldog do it? <laughs> Okay, maybe not every dog can do it. You know, you do have to have a little bit of nose capacity. Um, so that might, that might be a, a difference. But really, it is something that, that dogs love to do, and it's so easy, um, and it, it engages them mentally as well. So where did these, particularly the search and rescue dogs, come from? Um, how many people remember seeing the search and rescue dogs featured on TV, like at 9-11 or at Katrina? Yeah, I mean, they were, the, 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 the press was like, we need something that'll make people feel better. And so they really did focus on, on the dogs. And, and so that was the first time that the public seemed to become aware of what these dogs w were doing. And that was 9-11, and they really captured um, the, the soul of the, of the country at that time. Um, and then at Katrina, it was, again, a, a real focus. Although at Katrina, more of the pet dogs that were being stranded were, were focused on. Um, but the dogs that do respond may belong to the police um, or fire departments. They, um, for the majority of them, they're private individuals. I've had a number of people come to me and say, I want to have a career in search and rescue. 
I'm like, okay, well, you better find a career that pays you, and then you can do search and rescue, because the majority of people are volunteers. Um, even on the federal level, um, people will volunteer, and then if there is a deployment, and they only happen, thankfully, every couple of years, um, then you might get paid. But for the most part, it's not a, a career move. Um, the federal search and, um, urban search and rescue teams, they are, they're the elite of the search and rescue world. But again, most of those people work as volunteers until a deployment. All right, these are a couple um, of the different breeds uh, that are represented. Um, at, they were responding to 9-11, Hurricane Katrina. So you can kind of recognize the common breeds that you would expect. Uh, can anybody name the breeds? OK, a Belgian Taverne. Yeah, good. So not very many people would recognize this one right here is our Belgian Taverne. What other breeds are up there? Okay, Border Collie. We'd expect to see a Border Collie. Who's this? Australian Shepherd. Well, even without seeing the tail, or lack of tail, you can tell. All right, how about this guy? This guy's from Washington State. He's a rat terrier. He's Ricky the Rat Terrier. How about this one? Oh, I'm running. That one's actually also from Washington. Um, drove all the way down to Katrina in an air-conditioned bus and just could not handle the heat and humidity. Um, but responded pretty well with some sub-Q fluids. Uh, hard to see. We've got Goldens and Labs. Does anybody know what this one is? It's not. Kind of looks like a Great Dane cross with a Doberman cross. It's a Boceron. Yeah, crazy. And I'd never seen one before either. Um, so, <laughs> so we've also got our German Shepherds and Mal there's our Malinois German Shepherds. So a lot of the, the classic breeds. So, but what does it take? Why can these dogs do it? First of all, they can't be aggressive. They can't be aggressive towards other dogs, especially in the urban search and rescue situation where they're working off leash and there may be other dogs working. They can't be aggressive towards people. And the classic, you know, imagine yourself lost and trapped for 48 hours. No food, no water, and all of a sudden, this big aggressive dog finds you. <laughs> like, like, do I want to be found? Do I not want to be found? <laughs> We actually had some Boy Scouts hiding for our dogs last weekend. And we have this golden retriever who's got a very large bark. And the poor kid was hiding in this barrel. And he's like, I don't want to be found, because the dog's going, whoa, 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 whoa. And it wasn't that the dog was aggressive, but we teach them to bark very loudly so we know where to find the person. Um, but the kid was terrified. He's like, oh, it's OK. It's OK. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, the other important thing is that they have to have this thing called direction and control. I have to be able to stand here, send my dog up the stairs, out and around and back down. I mean, they really have to be able to go any direction that we need them to without me being close because this was a rubble pile. I might not be able to safely get up there. I also need to have them stop immediately on command because otherwise there could be serious injuries involved. So the bark alert, as I mentioned, we, we do a lot of hiding in these barrels, and you'll see in my video, the barrel just allows us to concentrate the scent. The dog's going to bark. We ask them to bark for 30 seconds. And it really, if you're in the barrel and it's echoing, it's really loud. And the, the other thing is they're really excited because they want to get into the barrel because their toy is there, and they really want to play with the toy. And most dogs will pull you out of the barrel in order to play. But it's all about the game. It's just a lot of fun. These are some of the things that they do in training. Um, important things like climbing ladders, rappelling. Um, this is a classic picture. This is a, a golden retriever named Riley. Um, he was on a high line, so just being comfortable, being transported at really huge heights, uh, walking across crazy surfaces like this chain link fence, riding in airplanes, and then working in these very unstable and, and strange environments. There are search and rescue dogs will often be wilderness-oriented dogs or urban or disaster-oriented dogs. Some will do both. Um, again, the urban dogs are a very focused group, and they tend to work in collapsed buildings, and they tend to be part of the federal disaster response. Wilderness dogs have usually a lot more action um, because they're going out with where people might have been lost, particularly Alzheimer's patients. Uh, Boy Scouts hunters that, that seem to, you know, their cell phone battery dies and they, they can't find their way back. Um, so those are some of the common things that they're used for. 
Certainly there's some you know, police indications for search and rescue, uh, but most of these were talking about the civilian groups. And the, the quality or the standards to which they train are extremely variable on the, uh, on the wilderness side because they're set by each community. Um, whereas the, the urban side, if they're federal, those are pretty much what we consider the highest standards. The other places that they search are avalanches, really important role. Um, for these dogs because we know how limited the time is if you've got an avalanche We really have to find that person who has been trapped The other place that they're used and again, this is not for live search. This would be for human remains is in the water um, and drowned um, People will actually release odor up through the water and the dogs can identify kind of pinpoint the general source So we know where to send the divers in to recover the body the live find um, is, is, again, the, er, the search and rescue. I'm going to show you a lot of video on the training, um, but what happens is the person hides, and when they're found and the dog barks, they pop up, they play with their toy, and it's a big game. Lots of fun. Uh, human remains, really important. Um, clearly, it, the, the challenge that we have in training the dogs for that is, is people need to donate human remains. Um, sometimes it's just fingernails and hair clippings and teeth extracted at the dentist. Um, so that can be a challenge for training some of these dogs, but there is definitely a, a call for, for finding human remains. The other important thing to realize, and this is as veterinarians, is what's really important, is the connection between the dog and the handler. These people know their dogs. There is such an emotional, physical, mental bond. They're, they're kind of like Siamese twins. Um, so if the handler says my dog is not right, the dog is not right. You may be able to do a physical exam and say, I can't find anything, but the dog is not right. There's something wrong because they are so attuned to what these dogs are doing, how they're responding, and it's at a level of sensitivity that the average pet owner would never even begin to imagine. Um, lots of jobs that these dogs are involved in. Um, you know, again, whether it's live humans, human remains in, in uh, Haiti at the earthquake there, in, in um, the tsunami in Japan, in 9-11, Katrina, uh, the Columbia crash, in you know, all of these places, um, these dogs have been called out. And more and more as people recognize what the, the capacity of the dogs is, they are continuing to be called out for, for these jobs. 